So how do you bear an image? How do you carry an image? Uh, we carry lots of images with us, hundreds of images that we've created, millions and millions of images we can find on our mobile devices or out in the cloud, online. We can carry these images with us wherever we go. And at a moment's notice, we can tap our way to almost any image that we want to see. But what if you and I were called to bear an image, to carry, to wear an image, one that everyone can see without having to tap our way? People can just see it. Well, I've been known to shed a tear uh, every now and again, especially more in the loss of loved ones or friends, but also reacting to works of art that inspire me, or even in witnessing other people's uh, reaction to being inspired or touched in some deep way. Wonder and awe seem to move me to tears. Here's an example. Years ago, my wife and I were sitting in a movie theater. We had just kind of towards the end wrapping up of a, a very popular movie called Saving Private Ryan. And I won't ruin this movie for you like I did Castaway a couple weeks ago, if you hadn't seen that movie. But I will tell you that there is one of the main characters at the very end who fought in World War II. He's now he's old. He's a, he's a grandpa. And he's bending down over the grave of a fallen soldier. The same soldier who had saved his life in the movie. Again, I won't ruin it for you. But it was an amazing creative moment. It was inspiring. It was very real. But I'm sitting there in that movie theater and I'm holding it together. Um, my wife and I were, were newly married and I wasn't really ready to, you know, launch into some tears in front of her just then. But then I hear sobbing, not a bit of sniffling or a little tiny cry, not a, a muffled cry, but a full-on sob. And it was happening just a, a row in front of us. And there they were, these two guys, these older gentlemen who looked the age of the character in the movie, were sobbing. And I went from being awe-inspired to being awe-struck like zero to 60 in a millisecond, and I start to lose it. And I was so unprepared that the first thing that happened is that somehow my tear ducts sent a message to my nasal cavity, and even before the tears started flowing, I blew one of those booger bubbles. You know, when, when you're sobbing, you can get those booger bubbles and totally appropriate. Actually, it's the only appropriate time to have a, a booger bubble is when you are sobbing. Everybody knows that, so it's all good. But I was a mess. I was awestruck by the image of deep sadness, grief, and I'm sure great love these two guys must have been feeling, identifying with that character in the movie. For me, they bore an image of knowing firsthand what sacrifice was and still meant to them. Awestruck. And 22 years later, I still am. I often find myself having that reaction to that particular generation. Stories that I hear about them. One of my best friends, Jason, I don't know if he's watching or not. Hey, Schumann, how's it going? Hope you guys are doing well in St. Paul. Uh, he talks a lot about the greatest generation especially when he talks about his grandpa. My wife does the same things when she talks about her grandparents. And even though I'm awestruck by their stories, I'm also awestruck by things that are happening in real time now with us. There is this online uh, short news show called Some Good News that has been out. I think there's been about 10 episodes. And it's an online show that digs deeper into uh, what's going on and stories 
uh, about how people are sacrificing and and helping others in during this time, this pandemic. And uh, shh, don't tell anybody, okay? But uh, episode one, when I came across it all those weeks ago, I teared up. Um, make sure no one knows. And I may have teared up a couple of other times when I watched the show as well. But that's okay. Awestruck. It's that same feeling I get when I hear in this text uh, that Parker read for us. Parker, thank you so much for reading. I hope your family is well. Uh, and I know it's not that time of year, but I'm just letting you guys know I've run out of Lefsa. So if you have any free time on your hands, um, you know, just putting it out there. <laughs> Well, Parker read for us uh, what is known as the resurrection chapter, chapter 15 in 1 Corinthians. So here, here's a little bit of background before we dig in. There's this church in Corinth. There's a church that the Apostle Paul helped found, and it was in turmoil. The members couldn't get along. There's lots of conflict. And word gets to Paul, so he writes a letter we know as 1 Corinthians. Uh, to address all of the issues that these uh, members of this church were dealing with. And one of the issues that they were dealing with was the question of what happens after you die. Uh, does the soul uh, just release from the body, or does nothing happen uh, to us after we die? Again, it is a, a question that is debated in our day and our time. But Paul takes on this argument, and he says that death is not the last word. He truly believes that. He has had a vision of the resurrected Jesus. He believes in the resurrection. And so for him, death does not have the last word. Uh, that while our bodies will be changed in some way, all of us, our entire selves, our whole selves, will be made new raised to new life. Paul teaches that at the last, the last moment, he calls it the last trumpet sound, uh, in a flash, blink of an eye, quicker than you can imagine, a millisecond. In that flash, we will be raised, all of us, not just our spirit, but our body as well. And Paul says that things will look a little different. Things will be changed for sure. But Paul is arguing for an entire whole body person resurrection. It is not just the spirit, but the whole body. And Paul says uh, that, that, that the whole body is what God has created. The whole body has been created good. And so God cares about the whole body, not just our spirits but our physical parts, even the stuff that we don't like about our bodies. Uh, one of the things that's happened to me in this pandemic time is I have seen myself on camera way more than I ever would have imagined uh, that I uh, have and even want to be. And I have noticed all kinds of things about my face, my nose, my lips, uh, my ears, uh, my beard. You notice that uh, I didn't shave today because I'm, I, I trimmed it up and my wife said, that looks pretty good. So I'm going with pretty good right now. That's as best as I can get is pretty good. But there are things that we don't like about our bodies. There are things that we judge about our bodies. However, Paul says, God made all of us. Not just our insides, not just our spirit, but our bodies and call them good. And so God is lifting us into this uh, new way of thinking that our bodies are a part of who we are. And it's an important part, just as important as our spirits. And this is one of the reasons why. Paul says earlier in the chapter, chapter 15, that our physical beings, uh, not just our spiritual beings, because you can't see someone's spirit necessarily, right? You can't go in and, and see someone's soul. 
but you can see the physical presence, that physical body. And not only does our physical being bear the image of the man of dust, Paul says, which we know is Adam represented as the man of dust who goes back to dust, right? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Um, but our, so our physical beings represent that and bear that image. But our physical beings also bear the image of the man of heaven, who was Jesus. So not only do we bear the physical image of Adam of dust, a, a reminder, especially in these days when there are so many people dying uh, from this virus, too many uh, in fact, and so fast for some places in our country uh, to be able uh, to figure out how to how to care for the dead in a, in a really dignified way. There's too too many. So we know of that uh, image of of dust that we bear that image of dust. Death is around us all of the time. But what we also are called to bear is the image of the man of heaven which is Jesus, that's you and I, through our physical presence, by our physical presence, we're called to show the image of Jesus, the man of heaven. And for you and for me, that image as Christians is one of sacrifice. That image is one of love. That image is one of hope. That image is one of joy and of beauty and of kindness. Those are the images that we bear, the images that God has called us to bear. And at this time, we also know that there are a lot of other images being shown. Our physical bodies are showing all kinds of other images like anger and hate and threatened violence. People who are showing up and protesting with weapons. That is not the image that God is calling us to bear. That is an image of, of something else. It's an image of certainly a frustration. You know, it's an image of, of trying to get back to normal. It's an image of sadness. And I want to tell you, I don't think there's anything wrong with being angry. I don't think there's anything wrong with being sad and mourning what's going on in our world. But our physical presence makes a difference in the lives of our families. It makes a difference in the lives of our communities. And how we carry our physical presence also bears on the image of God, an image of sacrifice. And what I am awestruck about is that you and I have the capability, actually you and I have the calling to reflect the wonder and the awe of the creator of it all. Have you stood in awe, the sheer wonder at what you've seen, overwhelmed by the grandeur, maybe to even tremble, to shake, to see the impossible become real, to witness the invisible made visible, to feel so small, insignificant, and yet at the same time feel like it was all for you. Time stands still, the totality of it all, fierce and wild, mysterious, even hidden, 
The psalmist claims it's one of awe and wonder. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He put the depths in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. That includes you, you know, all of us. You are wonderfully made. You, yeah, even with all of our imperfections, our blemishes, I think especially with all of that. Because God said, Behold, look at this. Behold, look at you. Come, everyone, come and look. In my image, I have created. In the image of me, I created. And I say good. No. No, I say very good. Come stand in the awe of what I have made.